All right, so let's get this started. First of all, a wonderful good afternoon and welcome to this installment of the Back to Basics track. So my name is Klaus Igelberger. Um, in case you don't know me, what I usually do for a living is indeed talk about C++, which sounds terribly boring, but um, actually it's quite a lot of fun. So it's, it's what I do. And if I talk about C++, when I talk about C++, then I usually pick topics that are dear to me. And one of these topics is value semantics. Because um, from my personal opinion, and I hope I can convince you of that, value semantics is not just a little thing. It's not just an afterthought. I actually believe it's an absolutely integral part of today's modern C++. And so in order to get you an impression of how the things have changed, I actually start with a trip in time. So I sent you back in time to the end, middle to end of the 70s. And so we're here at Cambridge University, which is actually a place where Bjarne wrote his PhD. And he wrote his PhD about something called, with the title, Communication and Control in Distributed Computer Systems. So, of course, he had to write some code for that. And he calls this code his simulator. Now, in which language did he write his simulator? And think about this. It's, it's mid to end of the 70s. And the first thought is, of course, C. No, actually, he didn't use C. He didn't use Fortran either. He did not use any of the languages that you're probably thinking about right now, probably because all of these languages were not structured enough. He actually specifically chose Simula, a program language that 10 years before, approximately, had been invented by these two people, Ole Andal and Christian Nürgert, two people from Norway. Um, and this was the very first program language that actually introduced something like class hierarchies and virtual functions. So um, this here is more like a class hierarchy here. You see the virtu virtual keyword on top. So this is pretty much why he chose this language. So not specifically because of virtual, no, no, but because it enabled him to structure his code much better, to cope with the complexity of his problem. And of course, um, this basically, um, changed his world. So when, uh, at the end of the 70s, then he joined Bell Labs, he actually encountered the C program language. C was invented at Bell Labs, officially released in 1972. And well, C was a lot like what he envisioned. It was a program language that was very fast and it was pretty portable. But what it was missing was actually structure, means to structure the code. And so he started a pet project which initially was called C with classes. You might have heard about that. But in 1984, it finally was called C++. The way he derived this language, however, of course, very much you know, changed the world, uh, changed the way we think about code. And this way of thinking, with this way of writing code, is deeply embedded in this book. Also a book that you might have seen before, The Gang of Four book. So the book that, um, at the time, collected design patterns 23 of them, and yeah, so published in 1904. And almost all of these 23 design patterns are based on inheritance, almost. I, th I think it's 21, but uh, this, is a, uh, this is a small detail. And so now let's take a look at one of them. I pick, for instance, the so-called visitor design pattern. Now, the point of this is not that we truly understand what this pattern is supposed to do. As a quick uh, summary, this design pattern is supposed to be, enable you to add operation really easily, really quickly, without having to change a lot of code. But let's focus on the structure, how we would write that, how we would implement this pattern in C++ at the time. And the only problem I have is drawing shapes. And I know usually people are not really yeah, happy about this particular problem, but see, but it's easy. And that's why I choose this. This is hopefully totally enough. Pay attention to the structure. So the first thing I write is a shape visitor base class. Really a base class, like uh, many classes that you have seen before, has virtual structure, it has virtual, pure virtual visit functions. And this shape visitor represents an abstract operation on some shape. So this is the base class for all kinds of operations that we'll have, uh, rotating shapes, translating shapes, drawing shapes. We have another base class, the shape base class. That is the shape, uh, the, the base class for all the shapes, squares, rectangles, ellipses, whatever. 
And it's a virtual function called accept, which accepts a visitor. And so it basically accepts an operation. Yeah? Do something uh, with this shape. Now note there is two inheritance hierarchies. The shape visitor base class, the shape base class, they form the, the basis for these two hierarchies. Then also note all of these virtual functions. Pretty much all the functions that we've seen so far are virtual. Um, of course, we want to implement them differently in different deriving classes. Now I have a circle. So a circle probably inherits from shape, but for that reason, of course, has to implement accept, has to implement this um, virtual function. Else the circle is actually quite, quite basic. A circle as a geometric primitive has a radius, perhaps a couple of other things like center point, perhaps something representing rotation, well, some, some more data members. So it could be more basic, but well, it has to deal with this accept function. Essentially, it just uh, calls the according visit function on a given shape visitor. There's also a square class, pretty similar, of course, but else the, square, uh, else the circle would be a Um Pretty much the same. Also here, we have to deal with this accept function. And note, all deriving classes need to do that. We cannot really free them from that. It's an integral part of that design pattern. All right. Now we have an operation, draw, which again has to derive from some base class, the shape visitor, and it has to overwrite the two visit functions. We have to. After all, this is how it's done. And of course, we now implement this by means of some, say, graphics library in order to draw a circle and draw a square. Then we have a draw all shapes function, which is given a vector of unique pointers of shape. So it's, it's quite a mouthful, a long type, but it has to be pointers to shape, because else I could not really draw different kinds of shape. shapes. I want to have circles, I want to have squares and all the other shapes together. And inside it simply traverses all the shapes and calls accept. So please run this operation, run this draw operation on all the shapes, and this will of course uh, draw a couple of beautiful shapes. Now in the main function, first have an abbreviation for this long type. So shapes is just short for vector of unique point of shape. And then we create a couple of shapes. Make unique circle, we say a radius of 2.0. Uh, makes unique square with say a side length of 1.5 and yet another circle. And then we draw all the shapes. Well, note that there's a lot of pointers floating around. A lot of pointers indeed. So a vector of unique point of shape. And I also have a, a lot of manual little allocations. And it's not just which some allocation, so the circles and squares are really small. And if I do this a lot, the memory is fragmented quite, quite quickly, which is, from today's perspective, definitely not something we want to have. So there is a lot of consequences to the style of programming. And over the years, we have actually realized this is not such a great idea. So this style of program has many disadvantages. First, there is these two inheritance hierarchies. Inher inheritance is intrusive. Now, this is usually a little hard to, to use everywhere. And of course, this inheritance also has these many consequences we've seen. For instance, the virtual functions. In fact, in this particular design pattern, we have to use double dispatch. So for every single operation, even if it's just a trivial one, we call two virtual functions. So the accept function first, which triggers the right visit function. So this might be quite expensive, as we'll see. So the performance is not just affected by the virtual functions, but also by the use of pointers. We jump around memory for pretty much everything we do. There's a lot of indirections happening. And of course, I mean, this, this kind of style promotes dynamic memory usage. Uh, different sizes of deriving classes, and so it doesn't have to be done, of course, but it's, it's usually done. And then I said there's many, many small manual allocations that, well, also do not uh, favor performance in particular. Okay, and then, well, you use unique pointers, true, but still it's pointers. So we have to manage lifetime somehow. And this is usually something that um, um, we would like to avoid. It's, yeah, of course it works nice, thanks to smart pointers, but it's something we have to do explicitly. And having pointers, of course, there is always the, the lurking danger of some lifetime-related bugs. 
Okay, not so much, perhaps if you use smart pointers, but still, ah, pointers. <sighs> There's a better solution. So as I said, over the years we've realized this is not such a great idea. And today, indeed, we don't like this anymore. We usually use a value semantics-based solution. And in this particular case, you actually might have an idea what I'm aiming at. I'm aiming at Studvariant. So Studvariant is not really a container, but it's something that represents several things. For instance, in this case, circles and squares. So this variant stores either a circle or a square. Not both, never both. And under usual circumstances, it truly just uh, has one and not zero. Now, as that, this variant actually represents an abstraction of shapes. And of course, there could be more circle, square, ellipse, rectangle. It represents the sh uh, an abstraction. What would be a good abstraction for something that represents circles, squares, rectangles? Well, a shape. This is a shape. And we're like, oh, wait, wait a second. This was what we usually had as a base class. No, it's not a base class any longer. Now it's actually something that is more value-like. And so let's take a look at how the code you now looks like if we actually build this on a variant. Again, I'm starting with a circle. There's no base class anymore. You realize that. So there is no base class because, well, <laughs> what, what do I need to inherit? There's nothing. And so this circle becomes something really simple. It is now nothing but a geometric primitive. Exactly the thing that it actually should be. It shouldn't have a lot of knowledge about what operations exist. No, no, it should be as simple as possible, reusable as possible. It should be a value. So we'll not use this as with circle pointers. We'll actually use circles as values. Also note, I said this before, we do not really accumulate dependencies. There's no accept function anymore, and there's also no replacements like draw functions. It's just a circle. And exactly the same thing happens to the square. That just is no, oops, this was too quick. Uh, there is just no base class. There is uh, no operations that we don't need. It's just a simple square. The draw operation. The draw operation itself, again, has no base class. It's just a class that you write wherever, whenever you need that. It's totally independent, which is actually the point of this visitor design pattern. So um, we can write this anywhere we like. And again, we'll use this as a value, not as a pointer. We'll not allocate a draw, we'll just create a draw on the fly. And now, um, I said this. And then there is this variant. The variant that represents different kinds of shapes. Circles, squares, and of course, potentially a few more. This is indeed value-like. This is indeed something that just represents um, the other two values. So values inside values. Pretty nice. And you use that in draw all shapes, which now does not accept pointers anymore. Now it takes a vector of values, a vector of shapes, which is actually um, easy to read, easy to, easy to write, and actually makes a little more sense. And so inside, we actually now use visit in order to apply an operation to this variant. So please draw whatever's inside the variant. Although this is already beautiful, let's take a look at the main function. The main function is absolutely astounding. There's, there's nothing more beautiful than this, this uh, main function. Look at, at the in placeback operations. As shapes and placeback circle. Next line, shapes and placeback square. That's fantastic, isn't it? You don't mention shapes directly. You actually just put different things inside this vector of shapes. It's natural. It's absolutely intuitive. This is what I want my code to look like. This is amazing. All right, so no pointers, it's values. There's no allocations either. Uh, of course, sure, the vector inside does some allocation, but I mean, we don't do a make, a, um, make unique. And here we have only values, which makes the code so much simpler, so much more intuitive, so much nicer to read, so much more easier to write. So, um, the style has indeed many, many advantages. There's no inheritance hierarchies. We don't need them in this context. 
the code therefore becomes so much simpler, which actually is, I would argue, uh, an example for the KISS, the keep it simple um, uh, principle. Then there is not a single virtual function in the entire program, not a single one. The dispatch now works completely differently, somehow magically done by this visit function. There's not a single pointer, of course not visible, inside vector it is pointers, but of course you know what I mean. Outside in the code that we write, that we see and have to maintain, there is no pointers. There's not a single manual dynamic allocation on my end, and uh, I do not have to manage the lifetime for anything. It just works out of the box. <laughs> Amazing. And so, um, of course, I also have no lifetime related issues. It's simple. It's absolutely uh, simple. As on a side note, the performance might be better too. This is something that people are very afraid of. Oh my, I'm using a value. This might be copied. This is slow. It's actually not. So let's take a quick look at performance. But, oh, okay, yeah, performance. <sighs> performance. You know that performance is difficult. This is why I usually don't do performance talks, because in, in a crowd like this, pretty, pretty much 10 people have something to complain about. So I will show you a couple of performance uh, results, but only if you promise me that you will take this not too seriously, and please only as qualitative results, because on your platform, on your compiler, on your machine, it will, of course, be different. So do you promise me that this is just some results? OK, <laughs> then we're good. So, I measured this on my own machine. So I'm now using four different kinds of shapes, which I feel is a little more realistic, circles, squares, ellipses, and rectangles. I create 10,000 uh, shapes randomly, so it doesn't have to be exactly 2,500 of each. I also do uh, one specific operation, a translate operation, which is moving the center point, which is a cheap operation. It's cheap. If I would use something like a draw, which might be expensive, you wouldn't see any difference. So the cheap is important to see a difference, and I benchmark both with GCC and Clang on an, some Core i7 with 3.8 gigahertz, just for, for the record. So here's the results. The classic visitor that I've shown initially runs at that speed. And I, I also do not take this as a, as a competition between Clang and GCC, this is just some results. Okay, Stud variant is faster by quite a margin. It's not just a little fast, it's actually so much faster that if you would get this performance uh, benefit, you actually would be employee of the month for several months. Seriously, <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely huge. Stud variant, in my experience, is great, but there is one that seems to be a little better. This is MPARC variant, which is absolutely uh, yeah, significantly faster and so really amazing. And it's just by turning towards value semantics. So I do not claim that it's always so much faster. That definitely is not what I have intended, but I definitely want to take the fear that there is something bad happening in terms of performance. Okay, so you've just experienced the advantages of value semantics, um, and I hope you've seen that value semantics makes your code much easier to understand, yet alone because there's less code. There is just not as much code as in the other code before. This is so much more boilerplate stuff. It will also make your code much easier to write. Of course, this makes you happy only once, but still, you are a happier person. It also makes the code more correct, I claim, because it just avoids so many common problems. Yeah, I mentioned these lifetime-related issues that, of course, you have to, uh, that you usually track by smart point, but still, um, it is simpler and potentially it will make your code faster. So, value semantics is definitely preferable in comparison to reference semantics. That's the opposite. And of course you're asking, what exactly is this reference semantics? And so let's take a look at one more example. There will be more, but here's another one. Definitely a smaller one, a simpler one, which fits on one slide. Let's say that first I have some print function for a vector, and I do start with a vector of integers, one, two, three, four. Then I actually create another vector. Call this W, and I pass V, and it is copied into W. Note that this W is const, so cannot be changed. I also have a span of int. Also const, and I can directly assign the V to S, 
and this, uh, vector, this banner represents the vector. All right, now I say W2 is equal to 99. And without really thinking, you can say, oh, this is a compilation error. This, this doesn't work. Of course, it cannot work. It should not work because the vector W is const. And so, yeah, you accept that. You're so used to that. But this is great. This little vector is not just a const as a data structure, meaning I cannot just add, uh, I cannot, I'm not limited in adding and uh, removing elements, but now the, the ints themselves are const too. The entire vector is a value that with a single const you can actually turn into something that is completely const. But now that, I can actually assign 99 to the span. And if I print that, it really prints 1, 2, 99, 4. Well, why, why is that? Well, the vector is value semantics. It really is a vector, a value. But the span, this is now working in the realms of reference semantics. A span is nothing but a pointer and a size. So if you assign a vector, it remembers a pointer to the first element, it remembers its size, and that's it. I know it, that still works, although the span is const. It is const, but unfortunately, conceptually, this is equivalent to a constant pointer. So note the const on the very right. The pointer is const, not the int. I cannot change the span, but I can change the values it refers to. That's perhaps not what you actually want to say. So semantically, it's actually a little harder to understand. So just for the reference, what you should do, probably what you intend to do, is you intend to have two cons. So you intend to have a const here, uh, here. This says the ints are const, and you might also want to make the, uh, the span itself const. But there's two. Two, and this is more complicated. This is harder to uh, remember, this is harder to use, this is more code to write. Okay, so let's, um, let's add another print function, uh, print function for span and um, keep the span S, yeah, so it's still, it's still the same thing. And yeah, let's, let's do something different. For instance, honestly, I feel the numbers one, two, three, four are a little boring, aren't they? Let's do something more exciting. Let's assign the values five, six, seven, eight, and nine. That is definitely um, making the game a little more fun. And again, then we just print that again. So we, uh, or we assign the, first we assign 99, which again works, we've seen that, and then we print that. It maybe prints 1, 2, uh, 99, 4. It maybe prints 1, 2, uh, um, 5, 6, 99, 89. I actually cannot really tell you what that prints. Honestly, I could just take a guess, but it actually should not really work. What we've not just done is we have triggered undefined behavior. Why? Well, because um, in the line above, we have given the vector new values, but unfortunately we've given it one more, which means the vector internally has to reallocate. It currently has a capacity of four. It was happy with that before, but uh, now it needs a capacity of at least five. So it reallocates. Unfortunately, the span doesn't get the note, and a span still refers to the old memory. It still points to where the, the one used to be, which, however, has already been deallocated. And therefore, well, it could actually print one, two, nine, three, four, but I don't know. It, it doesn't have to. Undefined behavior. So, note this span. This span is a problem. It really is, because this is a span that you keep around for longer time. And this is why there is the risk of lifetime. There is the risk of things changing, of invalidating the span, and this is the thing that you should avoid. And not just this span, but a span as a data member generally is not a great idea. You never really have control of that. You, you never know whether or not something else that it refers to goes out of scope or not. This one is bad. But now you, now you might be asking yourself, or me, does this mean that I now have to use values all over the place? Is references and things like span bad? Does the guy on stage actually try, try to discredit span? No, 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 actually not. 
Span is great. I'm actually a huge fan of Span and StringView and the like. They're huge, they're really good. And I use them here as a function argument. As an argument that um, yeah, is, is around for a very short time, briefly works to represent something like a vector, for instance, and this will work much, much more reliably. This is something that um, is, is way less likely to, um, to do any problems. And also the line above is okay. I pass a vector by reference. This is okay. Because I only for a short time within the function, I have to remember the vector and then the reference is, um, is dropped again. This is great. I thought the span is better. The first function only takes a vector of int. The second one takes a vector of int, an array of int, a built-in array of int, whatever you need. So references are great if used in the right spot. So as a, as, uh, as a takeaway, do not keep references, including spans, string views, et cetera, uh, around longer than they are needed. However, still references are kind of dangerous. So I have another example to just remind us that references indeed might be a little problematic. So consider this example. Again, I have the same print function, perhaps to a const int, this might be reasonable, yes. And I have a vector with quite a number of values. You note two times the value 42 in the vector. Now, of course, what else? So 42 twice, and this is now what I would get, uh, like to get rid of. So first, this prints the initial sequence, of course, and then I would like to get rid of the 42s. So how to do that? Well, I think we should use an algorithm. We should use max element. And then we need actually to remove that. So um, the max element function returns the position of the maximum element. Great. And in this position, we simply get to remove and erase. Ah, the remove erase idiom. Removing all elements. And here is where the, um, where the pass goes. Great. Now we print it again and get the sequence here. You note something? There's a 42 inside. There's a 42 somewhere close to the end. Didn't we just remove all the 42s? Wasn't this the purpose of this exercise? To remove all the 42s? Oh my. Okay, so something went wrong. And yes, it actually has to do with um, the way we call this remove function. So let's quickly take a look at how the remove function works. The signature of the remove function takes two folded iterators and a reference to a T a reference to a T. Now what we pass is indeed a reference to a position, which however unfortunately changes as we start to remove elements. So we remove the first 42, the fourth position. What is happening is that the four takes its place and suddenly four is the new max element. And so instead of a 42, we then get rid of another four that is missing in the second sequence. <sighs> This is hard. Now, um, I know at least one person in the room that would at this point say, but we would not use the remove erase ADM anyway. We have std erase. And I totally uh, agree. Std erase is great because it's so much simpler. Yes, but unfortunately, it's the same problem. Um, the problem persists. We still remove um, a 42 and a 4. So, references. They are just kind of dangerous. It's just something to keep in, in the back of your mind. There's a good reason why remove if takes uh, the, the argument by reference, but well, hopefully you get the point. Now, um, as Dave Abrams said um, in one of the last CPP uh, chat interviews, C++ takes value semantics seriously. And I hope by now you have an idea why. It's, it's seriously um, uh, better, seriously simpler. And so let's take a look at a couple of examples from the standard library. How does the standard library evolve towards value semantics? So now, um, the first thing definitely is the design of the STL itself, which is, well, something from back uh, in the day, so C++ 98. Even there, we already had a lot of value semantics for good reasons. 
Stood optional, um, came in C17, that is a value type. It's not a pointer to an uh, int, for instance, not a pointer to a string, that's a value that contains an int or a string. We'll see that shortly. Then I would, likely, uh, would like to talk shortly about expected, although it's not yet officially in any standard, but it will be in C23. And I want to quickly talk about std function, C11. And then a, a honors note goes to std any, I'll not show that, but uh, it, it, it also is a value type. So the design of the STL. From the very beginning, this STL was actually designed in terms of value semantics. There is a lot of, um, of um, um, signs that value semantics was already very important at that time. Of course, at that time, it wasn't perfect. There was no move semantics, for instance, but still, there is a lot of, um, of signs for that. For instance, as I've shown it before, containers are values. And so if you copy a, a vector, and you really copy the vector. So look at this example. I have a vector of integers again. This time it's one, two, three, four, five. And this is how it looks like in memory. So the vector v1 has a stack part. This is the three pointers on top. And these pointers point towards or, uh, into the, the memory where we have allocated the array. So on a, uh, on a free store, on the heap, wherever. So this is the values one, two, three, four, five. Now we have another vector, an empty one, which is indeed empty. The standard guarantees that it's an empty vector. And now we want to copy v2 into v1. That's a copy assignment. Now, how do we copy? Well, conceptually, what we could do, I said conceptually, we could just uh, do this. <laughs> and then, truly, the vector v2 would have the same values, right? But of course, this, it's not so simple. Because if you now change either v2 or v1, if you change one of the values, of course, this change should not reflect on the other um, vector. And so now, if you do that internally, you have to make sure that these two are um, yeah, well, copied on the right, at, at the right time. You might have heard about this before, the strategy. We call this a copy on write, which actually was used in, the, in some implementations of, for instance, to string. Back in the days, not anymore today, because in C11, we, we even don't do it here anymore. The wording in the standard actually prohibits that, uh, doesn't allow it anymore, and we've realized that it's not a good idea. In a multi-thread environment, it's just so much more difficult to keep track of these pointers, to do the copy at the right time. Ah, we don't want to meddle with these difficulties. So we do the obvious thing, we just create a copy. A copy. So we don't do a shallow copy, but we do a deep copy. And that's what all the containers do. Whether you have a vector, a list, a set, any container, they would do a real copy. And as such, there are values. You also do not copy an int, just 70 bit of the int, you copy the entire int. And so we also copy the entire vector. All right, so no sharing. Then um, const means const in the STL. So if you put a const in a container, if you've seen before, it really is const. You cannot add elements, you cannot remove elements, but you can also not change the elements themselves. Yes, the container is a value. But you also see this in the, uh, in the um, algorithms. Many, many algorithms take their arguments by value. And it's not just the um, iterators. For instance, copy if, just as one of many examples, takes the, the fourth argument, the unit predicate, as a value. Simply because there's so many advantages, it's so much simpler. And interestingly, even then, this was not considered a performance problem. So we do that a lot. And by that, you basically also do that a lot if you use the algorithms. Now, in C17, we got a new type called optional. Stood optional is, um, I believe a great solution for a lot of small problems. So this is a common example, perhaps you've seen it before. We want to write a toInt function. So we have a string of some sort, so we take a string view, and I said this is okay. And we actually want to parse that string view and extract an int, uh, the int that this string uh, contains. However, the world is not perfect. Uh, things might actually fail. The string might not contain a string, 
or the value might be too big for an int to hold, or um, yeah, it might be an empty string also. So there's many possible errors. Now, as it is, this function might just return a zero when we encounter any error. And it's actually done. This is something that the uh, ATI function does. If there's any error, if there's something not working well, then it returns a zero, which is a little unfortunate because you don't really know, did the string contain a zero or uh, was an error? And in case of an error, you have no idea what happened. So perhaps we could uh, throw on, um, on a uh, parsing error. <laughs> Somebody was um, already expressing not that this is not, probably not a good idea. This is one of these things that you heard in Bjarne's keynote also. This might fail. This might fail a lot. This might fail often. We do not want to throw an exception for things that potentially fail off. This is a little too heavyweight, I would argue. So we, we might actually do it this way. We could add a second argument, an int ref, and return a bool. So if anything happened, we return, say, false, and then we don't have to return an int. But if it succeeded, we feed the int, so uh, we return via the second parameter, and we return a true, which is not great to use. So uh, you cannot really uh, take the int directly, make it const. There's a lot of things we don't like about this interface. And so the other thing that was available before was to perhaps return a pointer. Oh, a pointer. So we allocate an int inside, returned by unique pointer, of course. And uh, this way we can actually say, well, here's an int, or no, sorry, there was an error, here's not an int. But okay, now we're super close. This is kind of the semantic that we want to have. We would like to have this extra state, this null state. And that's exactly what we get by means of optional. So now we return a value, we return an int, or perhaps not. So if there is some error in the string, if um, for whatever reason we cannot extract an int, we would return an empty optional. And by that, it's actually becoming simple. So there's no question of ownership in this context, N not at all. I know it's a value, it might be copied, it might be moved. There's no question here. There's also no question of semantics, like the pointer approach. Sure, we got a unique pointer, this was nice too, but um, here I don't even question that. There's no exception overhead, uh, also definitely something uh, great. And it is efficient. It is efficient because either the return value optimization helps us to get this in out, or perhaps in the worst case, um, the moves, uh, move semantics would help us. So in other words, it's simple. It is simple. The value makes this so much clearer, so much more natural. Except for perhaps one detail, and that is that I still don't know what really happened, what really ranked, went wrong. So was it an empty string? Was it perhaps a value that was too big? I just don't, don't know the difference. I just get a null, um, a null opt uh, back if and this fails. I would like to know the difference. And this is exactly what we'll get in C23, a, an expected, which is almost the same. I, I don't say the same, this is the wrong thing, but yes, we, we get an int or a string, which now I, I might now represent an error message. So because this was not a, a valid int, you get uh, no int. That's probably the real thing for errors. But still, that's the point. It's simple, it's a value. You can count on the fact that it will work, there is no question here. So all the other uh, arguments still perfectly apply. All right, next example, std function. In this example, I at the bottom have a function f, and this function f is supposed to do something. That's actually again a design pattern, we call this the command design pattern. So do something. And back in the case, we would actually write a base class for that, a command base class that uh, has some interface, but definitely something virtual, because this might now be implemented in various ways. There may be a print uh, command, a search command, an execute command, uh, just something. This is not what we do anymore. 
It's so much simpler today. Today, we simply pass a value. We pass an object of type standard function. I know it's a little cryptic, uh, this void int. Uh, this is something that um, you have to read up, you have to look into. But um, once you get that, it's so much simpler. This is how I would provide some callable today. Clean, simple, less code to write. So there's no inheritance hierarchies again. There's no intrusive design. I just write print and search and execute and I can write yet another thing. I do not have to uh, um, uh, uh, um, inherit from any, in any of these cases. Then again, there is no pointers anywhere. It's simple. There's no manual dynamic allocation. There's no life, manual lifetime management. There's less code to write. But now you realize uh, the arguments repeat. It's always the same things, but they are absolutely great. And so, the one takeaway from this talk, please prefer value semantics over reference semantics. The entire language is evolving in this direction. This is what we really consider to be modern today. There's a lot of other great stuff of modern C++, like smart pointers. But if you could avoid pointers in the first place, it would be even simpler. And so, please um, prefer value semantics over reference semantics. Do not say this perhaps um, in, a, in a, put this into a nice picture. Valley semantics is this realm where the sun is shining. The grass is green, everybody's happy, and the kids play outside. This is where you want to live. The realm of reference semantics is different. In a um, realm of reference semantics, the sun is not always shining. On, on the contrary, there may be clouds and thunderstorms, lightning. There's also bushes with, door and, uh, with, with thorns. And so now the, the kids do not play outside. It's too dangerous. Yes, you definitely want to live in the realm of value semantics for your child's um, safety. So <laughs> value semantics will make your kid much easier to understand. Alone because it's less code. It will make the code easier to write, easier to understand, it's easier to write. Um, it, I believe, firmly believe that it will be also more correct because you do avoid so many common bugs and potentially, not saying it will definitely, potentially it will even make your code faster. Because if it's simpler, perhaps even the compiler, so the optimizer might actually help you get faster. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. So is there any questions? If yes, uh, I believe you have a microphone, else I'll try to repeat the question. Please. Uh, you mentioned nothing about memory, right? Like the performance might be better, but what about memory? So what about memory usage? I did not mention that. True, because actually it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, so notice standard vector. Uh, standard vector inside, of course, does the allocations, just as before. It just turns out that um, it's not really something that you have to think anymore. Classes encapsulate the memory management. Take care of that. Take it out of your hair. And so you have a uh, much happier life. I should mention that, perhaps as a, as a side note, in the example of the variant, the memory usage was actually so much better. A variant contains circle and square. Yeah, as, a, as a value. And so there was one big vector of shapes. Yeah? One big vector of shapes. There was no pointers uh, that basically uh, required you to jump through memory. It's just one big chunk of memory. That's all you need. And so from a, uh, from a memory layout point of view, this is a huge advantage. I, I know exactly what you mean. I just cut you short because else I have to repeat so much. So, Timo said that in the initial example, a variant represents a closed set of types. So, in my example, it was circle and square. Whereas an inheritance hierarchy is a, an open set of types. You can inherit from uh, this space class any number of types. However, and that's exactly this visited design pattern, that's not true in that example. In the visited design pattern, you cannot add any new shapes. 
I mean, you could theoretically, like you could also add something to variant, but it is a pain. It is a pain. The visited design pattern really turns the world upside down. Now you cannot add any shapes in O, but as advantage, then you can add operations easily, which usually is hard in OO. Uh, so, by the way, as a side note, if you want to learn more about this particular design pattern, I have a separate talk on that topic, I believe, on Friday. Okay. <laughs> Any other question? Please. Um, regarding the first example with shapes, uh, can't we achieve the same thing using template meta programs and write specializations for the uh, different shapes of circle and square separately? So, um, I still repeat that. Isn't this effectively what we can also do with template meta programming? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, all of the examples I've shown are runtime polymorphism. Also, the variant approach. This is runtime polymorphism. If you take a closer look at how a variant is implemented, and for instance, take a look at this MPARC um, implementation, it's, it's not beautiful but reasonable, you'll find a switch inside. That's the magic behind the visit function. It does a switch, which quite ob obviously is runtime polymorphism. Now, at runtime, I dispatch. At runtime, I say, oh, it's a circle, and I go to that and that implementation. So, of course, you can do something with template meta programming, uh, compile time uh, uh, programming, but of course, it's a different world. Of course, it's uh, totally changing the, the, the example. Okay, yeah. thanks. Please. So, the question is, um, how about testing by means of mocking? This is what inheritance usually does, um, injecting some behavior that you can exploit uh, during testing. So this is not excluded in this example at all. So um, both, we are pretty much equivalent from an architectural or design point of view, both examples, the classic visitor and the modern visitor are actually equivalent. So um, if you want some testing, you would probably throw in yet another design pattern, which is the strategy pattern. And also here, you could use a value semantics approach. It, it's not so. For instance, by a std function. And instead of having a base class, uh, whatever that you mock, you would have a function that actually injects the behavior that you're looking for. And you can generalize that. It doesn't have to be a function, but well, you could use type erasure, which, as a side note, is another talk that I have on Wednesday. OK, but this is a different story. Um, uh, I think this is not at all prevented. Yeah? I didn't show any examples. I wanted to keep them simple. But you can definitely do that in both ways. See you on Wednesday. <laughs> all right. If that's it, thank you very much for attending. Have a great conference.